Gosh, it's my um, absolute, um, absolute pleasure to um, welcome you all to um, London School of Economics to this hybrid event. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Robinson. I'm director of the Grantham Research Institute at LSE. And I'm co-chairing this event with um, Professor Ralph Toomey. Can you wave your hands if you know which one you are? Thank you. Um, who's director of Grantham Institute of Imperial. So for those who don't know, um, the Grantham Institute of Imperial and the LSE were very much sibling institutes. We were started at the same time by the same funder, who I will mention in a minute. And um, so we are celebrating together our, our 15th anniversary of the foundation of these two Grantham Institutes. And this is, um, what you can figure out from the illustrious um, panel we have, this is a very special event. And I, I want to acknowledge, you know, I've said the word Grantham now a few times, and I just really want to acknowledge and thank the Grantham Foundation for um, something quite unusual for foundations, I think, and funds in general, that the long-term commitment they've shown to our two institutes. And it's allowed us, I think, to have the tremendous impact that we have done. And um, they may not want me to say that, but in the audience, we actually have Jeremy and Hannah Law Grantham. So I don't know if you want to... Um, just just wait, wait, raise your hand so people can see us in there. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> members of the Grantham Foundation that we've, um, we've come to um, know and love over these years very much, so you guys might just want to wave, wave your hands as well. They've all come over from the States, so thank you to the rest of the um, Foundation team who've come over for this event. Uh, we always really appreciate um, their, 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 their sage contribution and their sort of support and enthusiasm for our institute, so just a really big thank you there. Uh, so, yeah, so look, I'm pleased to be here um, welcoming up. We have an online audience, we have our in person audience um, here at our Shakespeare Theatre in our Chungking Ku building. So, we have um, six outstanding speakers who, from different perspectives, are going to be examining the um, ever, unfortunately, ever more urgent case for rapid and just transition to net zero emissions globally, um, whilst promoting sustainable development, prosperity, and well being within and across lower and higher income countries. So I'm just going to tell you the order of our speakers, and then um, that's virtually me for the night, other than I've got a few administrative things to say. But our speakers in order are, we've got Sir Brian Hoskins, who's um, coming from, who is the chair of Grantham um, Institute Imperial. We have um, Professor Yori Rogel, who is Professor of Client Science and Policy at Grantham. Oh, you've all lined up as well, look at that. From <laughs> 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 um, we have Amazing. Professor Norman Stern, who is the chair of Grantham Imperial. Right, Grantham Research Institute here at LSE, it's a tongue twister. And then we've got Professor Nick Robbins, he's our professor in practice here at Grantham LSE. We've got Dr. Freddie Otto, who's a senior lecturer in climate science at Grantham Imperial. And we've got Kate Hyam, who's a policy fellow at Grantham LSE. So just to let you all know that um, this event is being recorded, and if the tech doesn't fail us, hopefully it will be made available as a podcast subject to technical difficulties. Um, after the speakers have um, spoken to us, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to the speakers. Uh, Ralph, is, uh, co-chair, is going to be taking over that point and moderating the Q&A. Uh, for our online audience, um, you can submit questions via Q&A feature, apparently in the top left of your screen, so that's, that's right. Um, if you do, uh, please let us know your name and affiliation, and we're always really happy and keen to hear from our students and alumni, so let us know if you are one. Um, and for those of you in the theatre, Ralph's going to let you know when we open the floor to questions, raise your hand, wait for a microphone, use the microphone so people online can hear. And we're going to try and um, ensure there's a range of questions from both online and audience here in the audience. So, um, yeah, for now, I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to our first speaker, Professor Sir Brian Hoskins. Change the slide, I was talking to you do it. I thought that would do it. Maybe this. Oh, okay, that was me welcoming you and introducing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Right, my job in 10 minutes is to uh, make you comfortable with the, or not comfortable with the climate scene, as we see it, um, the physical system. And I'm going to go very quickly through some slices which are very familiar to people and then try and, try and draw, draw out a few points and then give you just an overview of the last year perhaps and on the large scale. So this picture here is one you're probably very familiar with. It's measurement of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and this was taken from two days ago and 
not to uh, spend too long on it, back from 1958 to present day, and you see it rising and rising. And you wouldn't know that anyone had been worried about this because it doesn't seem to stop rising. And what we know is, while this continues to rise, then the climate system becomes less efficient at getting rid of the heat. And that means the Earth warms up. While ever this curve goes up, the Earth warms up. And as we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, this curve will go up. So temperature, you're very familiar with these sorts of temperature curves again. And however you do it, they all tend to agree. And the one in the middle is the one that I've shown over the years. But then Ed Hawkins at Reading made remarkable impact on the population by actually showing this as climate stripes, which is what's behind. So there's cold on the left and there's red warm on the right. And you wouldn't believe how that took over compared with our graphs. <laughs> anyway, so sea level rise. And if we go from 1993, which has been measured from satellite, then it's gone up 10 centimetres. And from the previous industrial time, probably 20 centimetres. So that one of the things now is you can measure from satellite the weight of ice at the two poles. And we know there is now a contribution to this sea level rise from the melting of Antarctica and from the melting of Greenland. So those are now measurable contributors to this rise, which is currently about three or four millimetres per year. That's um, 40 centimetres per 100 years. Um, so getting on to some of the projections in the IPCC, I won't show too many, but um, this again that most of you will be familiar with, the black bit on the left is what we've had already in terms of globally average temperature, and then it depends on what we do, the projections. So if emissions fall rapidly to zero, then we could be on one of those lower curves, and that sort of satisfies the Paris target just about. Whereas we keep going as we've been doing and as we continue to do, then we're seeing up at four or five degrees by the end of the century. And if you believe the targets set there but for the countries by themselves, then we might finish at the moment somewhere in the middle of that. Um, now I want to just, again these are very familiar pictures, rather than looking at globally average temperature, uh, just look locally and I'll, given the time I'll just concentrate on the one on the left, temperature. So if the globally average temperature rise is 4 degrees, then almost everywhere over the ocean the temperature rise is less than 4 degrees. That's because it takes a lot of heat to the heat up the ocean. And almost everywhere over the land, it's more than 4 degrees. So we should remember that in the tropics, if it's a 4 degree global temperature rise, you'll be adding more than 4 degrees to the hottest places on the planet. And as we go to the north, to the northern areas, you see even in the annual average, we're looking at temperature rises of 7 or 8 degrees. And in winter time, that's probably more like 12 degrees. So that's, um, we shouldn't be fooled when we're looking at globally average temperature. It means a lot of different things to where you are. Now, another thing to look at, um, if you look at our area in the Atlantic, there's a minimum temperature rise, whereas over the south, southern Europe, there's a large temperature rise. So the temperature contrasts are changing. Now, weather depends on the temperature contrast. So that means it's not just warming up, it means the weather is different. So you don't just keep the same climate and warm up, your whole climate system is different. And the other thing to note, if the temperature is that much, three or four degrees higher over the ocean, that means the atmosphere will be hold, can, over the ocean, hold probably a quarter more water vapour. And once that moves into the storms, that means even if nothing else changes, those storms are liable to be a quarter more precipitation. And as the, the air, the water vapor condenses, the latent heat feeds the storm and makes that storm stronger. So we're looking at big changes associated with the weather in that situation. Now I'm showing one here from IPCC again, and it's projections of sea level rise. And you see generally clustering half a metre to a metre by the end of the century. But this is one of the things the IPCC did this time, was to actually go a little from the rather conservative things that it tended to do and say, well, 
what can we not rule out in terms of in terms of the physics that we understand? And if you look at that dotted line, it says that if we're on the higher scenario, we cannot rule out that the sea level rise would be two meters by the end of the century. And in fact, that's what the next um, Thames barrier is being designed so it could cope with, because this is a possible thing in terms of what we know about the physics. And it would involve some um, extra contribution, in particular from probably the Antarctic ice sheet. So it depends on the stability of the polar ice sheets. But then if the other thing about sea level rise is if we go to the end of the 2300, then sea level continues to rise, even on those lower scenarios. So we're looking at something like half a metre to three metres sea level rise by 2300, even on those ones that satisfy the Paris targets. On the upper ones, it's two, two to seven metres, and we cannot rule out 15 metres or greater. And that takes us back to where sea level was. Perhaps the last time the CO2 was the same level. Now, I wanted to show a few pictures from this year, 2023. And this shows the march in temperature over the year. And you can see the clustering of those black lines is what's happened in the previous 80 years. But then there's 2023, which is close to that 1.5 above pre-industrial the whole way through. And then, in the later part of the summer, is definitely above it. Now, that doesn't mean we've already broken with 1.5. This is one year and that's not what the Paris target will be. However, it shows how close we are and how things are changing this year. So if you look at September this year, on the right you see September 2023, and you see the rest of the years back there. Now this change from one September to the next is at the edge of what you could possibly say is in terms of natural variability. And uh, so we see this was an amazing September. But this follows a July where the sea surface temperature anomaly, so that's the ocean, measuring the top of the ocean, and you see the North Atlantic and you see the Pacific on the left, that's an El Nino starting there, and we're looking at temperatures three degrees or so above the normal, and the North Atlantic mostly that, and the Mediterranean certainly that, and uh, that's uh, no doubt implicated in some of what's happened this year in the Mediterranean. Now, this excess heat couldn't just be come directly from the uh, heating of the planet. It's actually come from a redistribution in the ocean. But is this going to continue? We don't know. The other thing that's amazing this year, um, in terms of the larger scale, is looking at the Antarctic sea ice extent. Now, up to now, this shows this previous period of 40, 30 years, and they've all been that grey line. This shows July through to November. And this is when the Antarctic ice sheet is at its maximum, and they've been always pretty close together. In fact, much closer than we've been able to understand. But then 2022 was strange. 2023, has this entered a new regime? Well, we don't know. It's certainly caught up with what we expected to happen. So there are some interesting things going on in the climate system. So I bring you the final thing. The IPCC assessments underline the imperative for urgent action, and the recent behaviour of the climate system suggests it's even more urgent. Thank you. where we will be going. Um, I want to reflect on um, kind of the undelivery of the, or, on, or the undelivered necessity of net zero. And I want to reflect on that uh, through three dimensions. First, uh, the physical necessity of reaching net zero. Then looking at uh, combining the physics with the politics, looking at what um, 
<coughs> policies and, and, and pledges are currently uh, providing us and delivering. And then finally, I want to look at the global risks or the global warming risks that this still implies for us. We start with the physics, and the physics are really clear. This is one of the iconic figures of the IPCC that uh, several members of the Grantham Institute actually have proudly contributed to over the last decade. Um, simply shows that every ton of CO2 adds to global warming. On the horizontal axis, you have cumulative emissions since pre-industrial of cumulative emissions of CO2. On the vertical axis, you can see global warming. There is a remarkable linear trend between those two. And you can see that in the history, that's the wiggly line on the left. And you can see that going forward with the different colored cones. These colored cones, they represent different scenarios, different futures in which we double our emissions until the end of the century and go beyond that, or we halve our emissions by in the next decade and we go to net zero by mid-century. Despite these massively different futures, these lines are pretty much right on top of each other. So that really means every ton of CO2 adds to global warming, no matter the pathway we follow. And that has really simple implications um, for policy. To halt global warming, we need to stop adding CO2 to the atmosphere, so net zero is a physical necessity. Um, if we delay uh, red reductions in CO2, this always comes at a cost, either at the cost of faster reductions afterwards to stay within the same carbon budget, or at the cost of seeing higher warming. And finally, if we exceed the temperature level that we think is safe, the only way to, in a, to, uh, to sustainably get back below that level is to actively remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. One additional implication of this, uh, of this relationship is that to limit warming to any level, we have to limit, limit the total amount of our carbon dioxide emissions within a carbon budget. And the IPCC estimated that carbon budget. Uh, you might all have heard that the carbon budget for 1.5 is very small. Well, it's actually not that small, but it's only small because there is this massive blue bar of emissions that we have already emitted in the past. This is just until 2019. Um, from 1750 to 2019, we emitted more than 2,500 billion tons of carbon dioxide. Um, the remaining carbon budget for limiting warming to 1.5, the most stringent limit in the Paris Agreement, is, um, is around 400, 400 billion tons uh, if we want to have a 2 in 3 chance, or 500 billion tons if we are happy with the flip of the coin, coin chance, uh, a 1 in 2. Um, research that we published earlier this week and that updates these numbers actually halves these estimates. Uh, once again. So now we have two, 250 billion tons of CO2 left, and the reason for that is uh, a better understanding of some of the physics, but also three years have passed and we have emitted around 40 billion tons every single year since. With the carbon budget, net zero becomes a necessity because that's the only way we can stop adding carbon to the atmosphere. Um, and Net zero targets are therefore milestones that are underpinned by the physics. But not every net zero target is the same. We know that net zero CO2 will lead to a stabilization of global warming if we achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions because of how the different gases interact. Um, we actually achieve more. We actually achieve a peak and then a gradual decline in global warming. And that is very important to be aware of. Um, in my view, reaching net, a net zero world is only the beginning towards a future in which we actually try and reverse some of the warming that we will end up with and that will most likely be higher than we as a society are comfortable with. Finally then, I want to contrast some of the narrative around pledges and policies. There are lots of stories out there that show that on the one hand, we are way off track, this is a, a, a picture of the UN Environment Programme's emissions gap report that says that we are far off track, there is little progress made, and we are, and, and warming is going towards three degrees by the end of the century, still increasing thereafter. On the other hand, you have 
you have narratives that say that we're almost there. Scientific papers, the International Energy Agency said that the pledges, if implemented, they will deliver us a global warming of around 1.8 degrees. The key difference between those is, of course, the right-hand side are pledges and promises. On the left-hand side, we see the policies and of what is actually implemented uh, on, uh, on the ground. And these two cases are here represented visually. The dark blue are what we estimate emissions will do under current policies. The light green is what we estimate emissions would be doing if all the pledges and promises of countries are, uh, are, integra are, are implemented. And you can see that there is a huge gap. Now, what does this gap mean for global temperature? And on the right hand side, I will be going just through the different global warming projections for each of those cases. And what I want to, want to highlight is that central estimates of, of what these cases imply really hide important climate risks. For example, the, the central estimate of current policies leads to a best estimate warming of around 2.5 degrees nowadays. Um, however, there is still a 20% chance that warming will exceed 3 degrees and a non-negligible chance that it will exceed 3.5 degrees. From a risk management perspective, these are chances that you don't want to take. If you look at the lowest end, and that is really the most optimistic of what we can be today, uh, given uh, the pledges and the promises that we have, uh, we see that global warming is, the central estimate is somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees, but there is a 20% chance that warming is still larger than 2 degrees. Where do we think that we are actually going. Um, we, we, we did an exercise. Uh, we looked at the credibility, both of policies and of pledges, and we created a case uh, that lies in the middle. And if we see that, if we, if we integrate only those pledges and promises of which we, for which we think there's credible evidence that they will be implemented, then we end up there. Somewhere with the best estimate between uh, two and two and a half, but with a one in 10 chance that we will still exceed three degrees over the course of this century. tutors on the science side, so thank you, thank you all. Now, in eight minutes, I'm going to take you through the sustainable growth story of the 21st century, the investment we need to uh, get us there, and how we finance that investment. So I'm going to go pretty fast. We've already heard that uh, action is urgent, and uh, uh, Yuri set out the graphs which tell us uh, how fast we have to move to keep anywhere near 1.5 within reach. But what I want to emphasise here is that if we make the investments we have to make, and we have to make a lot of investments to uh, uh, bring down the emissions on the scale that we need, then with those same emissions, with those same investments, we set ourselves on a path of sustainable growth, much more attractive than the dirty, destructive models of the past. And it can be resilient and inclusive growth as well. So that's the story I want to tell, but it's got to be big investment. If from the point of view of the world as a whole, you're talking about a two or three percentage point increase in investment in most of the emerging market and developing economies where the action will really take place. We're talking about three, four, five percentage points increase in investment. Perfectly possible, 
from uh, a world economy which has suffered from a deficit of investment, perfectly possible, that's the basic Keynesian macro, and perfectly possible in terms of history, if you look back 20 years or so, those levels of investment were higher. So a big challenge, but it's possible, it's feasible. To coin a phrase, uh, yes we can. The for investment to come into existence, whether you follow von Hayek or Keynes, it's about expectations, and it's about risk, and it's about getting things done. So in order for that investment to happen, you need clear, strong strategies around the world, and uh, uh, you have to have uh, investors who can see where it's going and have reason to believe that if they invest, they can get the revenues and they can get things done. So that's the challenge of policy, and of course institutional structures can be very important in creating that investment. So that's the story. I'm not going to dwell on this, Yuri has already given it to you, but Michael Mann in his book, uh, Fragile Moment, essentially said that this is the next, in this next decade or so, we will decide whether we're going to be anywhere near 1.5 or whether we're likely to be uh, closer to 3. That is in our hands in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, 1.5, as Michael put it, as Mike Mann put it, is bad. Three is potentially civilization ending bad. So that's the choice that we have to make, and we have to make it consciously and directly. Those who say, well, all this investment stuff's all too difficult, and why don't we go a bit more slowly, uh, are essentially, <clears throat> in one way or another, uh, denying the science. They're saying, actually, if you do postpone, if you do end up nearer uh, three degrees, actually, uh, we can manage it. It's not too bad. And for me, they, the delay story is the most risky and the most unrealistic of all outcomes in terms of um, uh, what it means for us all. So we can't accept that it's too difficult. What we can do is to make uh, clear how we can overcome those difficulties. And that's our job. That's what we have to do. So here's the central part of what I want to say. Why is this the growth story? Well, first, the clean is already cheaper than the dirty across at least 30% of emissions. Probably uh, in seven or eight, nine years' time, that statement will be the clean is cheaper than the dirty across about 70% of the emissions. And it's where the innovation is really taking place. The bright young engineers and technologists are really all about folk that relentlessly focused on creating these new technologies and they're moving very quickly. So already lo lower costs through much of the story of the, in terms of clean being cheaper than dirty and that's where innovation is. Increasing returns to scale are enormously important here. Just one example, the Indians crashed the price of LEDs. They brought it down by a factor of five in a year or two by going to major scale. Lots more increasing returns to scale right across these technologies. Much of what we have to do is about resource efficiency, including energy efficiency, but resource efficiency more generally. Efficiency is productivity, is growth. A lot of this is about changing the big systems, cities, energy, transport, land, water. Cities where you can move and breathe are much more productive than cities where you cannot. That is a story of productivity and growth, similarly across transport and land and so on. Um, improved health is fundamental. We kill from air pollution in the world perhaps five or ten percent, sorry, five or ten million a year. In a world where something a bit above 50 million die each year, so five or ten million deaths associated with air pollution in a total number of deaths which is a bit over 50 million. That's huge. Most of that air pollution, not all of it, but most of it comes from burning fossil fuels. And I would, I would hope that um, uh, not killing people is a good idea anyway, but not maiming people is also a good idea, and maiming people is also bad for productivity. <laughs> and of course, if you increase investment itself, you'll drive growth forward. The only one of these six stories in our standard general equilibrium macro growth models is the investment one. All the rest is by assumption excluded from those models. In other words, those general equilibrium integrated assessment models are writing out of the script everything that's interesting and matters in this story. It's all about structural change. How much do we have to invest? 
in emerging markets and developing economies outside China. I'm taking this from the work with Amar Bhattacharya, Vera Songwe, and uh, others. Just focus on the 2,400, which is in the middle of the bottom <coughs> row. That's uh, the flow of investments in emerging markets and developing economies outside China that we have to make as uh, a world by 2030 in relation to climate. That means energy transition, adaptation, and uh, resilience, and natural capital. So that's the number, that's the flow of investment that we need to be able to uh, finance. And this is where most of my work has been concentrated in the last couple of years. I said 2,400, look at the second row on the right-hand side of this um, graph. We've got domestic resource mobilization, 1,400 um, billion, and uh, on uh, external finance, uh, 1,000 billion, or in other words, a trillion. Now, roughly we've made an assumption, you know, it, it's crude, but it's based on experience of what can be generated internally. In most economies, most of um, investment is financed internally. And a lot of these economies, that wouldn't be so easy to do, but it would still be the majority. How do you generate 1,000 um, billion a year, 1 trillion a year? Roughly speaking, we suggest it's split in these three ways, which is the bottom row of the right-hand side. A bit over half is, um, a bit over half is um, private, uh, something like 250, 300 would be uh, MBBs, and something like 150, 200, very concessional finance. That involves a tripling a tripling of the financial flows from multilateral development banks. That's what we put to the G20. That's what went to the, the annual meetings of the World Bank and IMF in Marrakesh just a couple of weeks ago. It was welcomed by the finance ministers who asked uh, Brazil, next president of G20, to work on the implementation, and it was welcomed by the heads of the NDPs. We've got a real chance of getting there. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it means very strong support from the shareholders. So work on your shareholders of those uh, institutions. Last slide then, this is what we have to do. We have to create the conditions so those big investments can come through. Uh, a lot of countries have debt, fiscal constraints. Those, uh, we have got ideas about how to handle that. You've got to create the, high, the new highway for private finance so that the ability to come is there. That means managing the risk for, those, for the finance, both on the investment characteristics themselves uh, we know whether you can sell the electricity that you're generating, for example, and the uh, risk sharing. I've already mentioned the uh, triple agenda. There's a great deal to do on concessional and debt-free finance. That will include the OC development assistance. It will include um, uh, use of uh, special drawing rights. It will include philanthropy. It will include voluntary carbon markets and so on. So that's the story. We really can do this. I'm enormously optimistic about what we can do. I'm deeply, deeply worried about what we will do. But <laughs> our job is to turn what's possible into uh, what actually happens. Thank you. It's a real delight to be here at the 15th anniversary celebration for the two Grantham Institutes. Again, my thanks to the Granthams. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Just Transition. Um, 15 years ago, the Just Transition was a concept and a strategy that was in the international trade union movements. Um, in 2015, it was put into the uh, Paris Agreement, the imperative of just transition for workers and decent work as we drive towards net zero. And now I, I would like to argue to you that it's absolutely essential as a key enabling factor to, to move on as we go forward. I'm going to talk about what the just transition is, uh, why it's so important for net zero, some of the obstacles, and then say what's, uh, what's, what's next. So what, does, what is the just transition? It puts people at the heart of achieving net zero, workers, communities, citizens, particularly in the global south. Many people say there's not a good, robust uh, definition for, for just transition. The International Labour Organization, which is the champion within the UN system, has got a set of guidelines. This is how it sets it out. Just transition involves maximizing the socio and economic opportunities, so the upside area of climate action, while minimizing and carefully managing any challenges. Uh, and then how do we manage those challenges? How do we seize those opportunities? Effective social dialogue among all groups impacted, and then secondly, respect for fundamental labour principles and human rights, and human rights more generally. So that's the that's the agenda. 
Uh, we have the global stock take, which is going to be reviewed and major conclusions drawn from that at the COP uh, coming up in a, in a few weeks' time. What does it say about just transitions? It says just transitions can support more, more robust mitigation outcomes, so driving us quicker towards net zero, and also help with this upward spiral of ambition. It's a positive reinforcing factor. So this is moving, I think, very quickly into the agenda for, for leaders, um, and it's, it's, it's becoming, I think, ever more and more present in terms of political discussions. I think we can see that in the uh, US Inflation Reduction Act, the way the President Biden is using clean energy as a driver of, of jobs in the US heartlands, but also good quality jobs, good paying uh, union jobs that help produce emissions, but also focusing about 40% of that fiscal money on particular, particular communities to drive environmental justice. You also have South Africa, President Ramaphosa, South Africa being the first country to put Just Transition into its uh, climate strategy, highlighting uh, the importance of climate action and the benefits for all uh, his people. But this is a country that signed the first Just Energy Transition Partnership in Glasgow and a broader 100 billion Just Energy Transition investment plan. So it's a leadership agenda. Why is it so important for net zero? Firstly, because if we intentionally shape net zero strategies um, to deliver uh, more and better jobs. We're going to get there quicker. We can get there quicker with community benefits. So it delivers social progress. Secondly, it does consciously uh, and it anticipates some of the distributional shocks, particularly as we need to rapidly phase out the use of fossil fuels. We need to make sure in, in the jargon that le this leaves uh, no one behind. Third, it's focusing on developing the new capabilities the skills, and if you want to use that phrase, the human capital, capital that's going to be needed for this thriving uh, net zero uh, economy. And I think India uh, is, is a good example there of what, what's happening. And finally, uh, it makes sure that net zero is not a top-down uh, process, but it brings active involvement and making participation uh, core, particularly for vulnerable and excluded groups. And I think the work Scotland has been doing through its Just Transition uh, Commission is, is particularly interesting here. So if we take these features together of the Just Transition, then it can really bring about real-world out outcomes, better jobs, uh, community renewal, involvement of people in the process, but also, importantly, uh, generate the public uh, trust in net zero. So that's, that's the proposition, and I think we're seeing elements of that. But we need a bit of a reality check. What are the obstacles we, we see? And I see three really facing us. Firstly, a commitment gap. Uh, we still see from, from governments insufficient uh, action eight years after the, the Paris uh, uh, Agreement. Uh, from business, uh, the latest uh, Climate Action 100 plus net zero benchmark suggests only about 10% of the world's most carbon polluting companies have just transition plans. Only 3% of those have designed those plans uh, in discussion with their, in consultation with their stakeholders. So we have a commitment gap. But also we have an implementation gap, particularly uh, in terms of finance. I mentioned South Africa was the first country to, uh, to agree with its international partners, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, as well as South Africa. We have Indonesia, we have Vietnam and Senegal now. But really, that, those partnerships are still yet to deliver. And quite a few questions about the type of financing that's been provided and whether actually more grant-based financing is needed to support uh, countries in the global south. And then we have private finance. This is something that uh, we at the LSE and my colleagues here work a lot on. How do we get the private finance from banks and investors to take on board and integrate just transition principles? But really, these are yet to be fully embedded into net zero plans, something we need to work on a lot more. And then finally, we could call it the integrity gap. Uh, I think we see as, as the interest and, and the importance of just transition is recognised, there is a risk of uh, what could be called justice washing, to, to sort of go alongside the greenwashing we see on the environmental front. And this could really mask uh, inaction. Also, I think we've seen uh, in the political world how the fairness agenda can also be uh, misused to slow down climate action. And the reason we've got an uh, oil rig there is that when the Rosebank oil uh, field was licensed uh, by the UK government recently, uh, the Environment Secretary described it as part of the UK government's uh, just transition. 
So, what's, what's needed next? Clearly, we need better policy. Uh, we need to make trust transition really core to net zero policy, not, not just in the energy system, but also in terms of nature, in terms of agriculture, land use, and ending deforestation. We need to make it very, very specific to place context-specific solutions to bring the transformations we need. Within the business world, we need uh, businesses to agree just transition plans with their workers and stakeholders. Finance, we need the finance sector to change the mechanisms they use and the metrics they deploy to measure performance to drive system transformation. And then in a few weeks' time at COP, we need to negotiate a strong just transition work program in the UNFCCC and then back it by public finance to deliver in the global south. Thank you so much. After two quite optimistic talks, although the last one ended on a, on a pessimistic note, I will go back to some less great news, but also why does this matter, why do we care, and why do we really need to do these transitions? Um, so we, of course, in this room, all talk about climate change all the time and care about it, but most people don't. And most people don't talk about it or care about it. But when the question comes up is when something like this happens. Or something like what we have just experienced uh, this day, um, uh, more to the south than in London, but Storm Kieran, then suddenly everyone asks the question, is this climate change? And um, for a long time, we didn't, we, the scientific community, didn't quite answer that question, but it was more like, well, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that you would expect. Um, but that has change now with um, the science um, development that's called attribution science, so the attribution of extreme weather events. And what you see here is the result of one of these studies that we did um, with the team at the Grand Imperial for well, weather attribution uh, for the extreme rainfall that led to the very severe flooding in Libya and previously in Greece. And um, the results were that climate change um, for our burning of fossil fuels over the last years has made this event up to 50 times more likely to occur. But of course, um, there was the rainfall, um, the role of climate change wasn't the only reason why this weather event led to a disaster. What turns weather into a disaster is always uh, vulnerability and exposure. And it was actually one of the, I would say, newest or the um, findings of the last IPCC report, where the IPCC has really corrected its previous assessments in, uh, in the, the reasons for concern. So um, how vulnerable are we to changes in the climate? And there, in all the areas, including extreme events, but also threatened and unique systems, we have learned over the last decade that our societies and our ecosystems are much more vulnerable than we originally estimated, and that we are much less able to adapt to even comparably small changes that we see now at approximately 1.2, 1.3 degrees of global warming. And the results we've all seen this, this year in cases like Libya, um, and, uh, and yeah, heat waves across the Northern Hemisphere, droughts in East Africa, in South America. So we all see these impacts already, and we see the dramatic impacts on ecosystems, but also particularly on people, and the more vulnerable people are, the larger the impact. So in this event, more than 2,500 people died, which is a very, very large, um, crazy large number for a flood event. Where in a country like the UK, you usually have so the last strong, but that we had about four deaths in, in the UK. So, how do we know this? So, the idea, how, why can we do this now and couldn't do this before? So, the idea behind um, extreme event attribution is very straightforward. And uh, what you see here in the top graph, that's the, the, the simple, straightforward way, but it's real data. It's from the um, from the heat wave in southern Europe in July, earlier this year. 
And what we do in our land attribution is we find out what's happening today. So what kind of event is this? So in this case, it was maximum temperatures over two weeks in July. And you can see that, um, that they are where this dashed line in the red curve is. It was about uh, a bit over 32 degrees. And we found that actually this event is not very rare in today's world. It's about a 1 in 10 year event. So in any given year, you have a 10% chance of such a severe heat wave to occur. And then because we know very well how many greenhouse gases have been put into the atmosphere and how much warmer the, the, the globe today is, we can remove these greenhouse gases from models, atmospheres, and we can also just scale our observations back to a 1.2 degree cooler world. And then we can find out how would this event have looked like in a world without climate change. And as you can see here, this event would never have occurred if it wasn't for a human-induced climate change, because in a world without climate change, the possible temperatures over southern Europe in July are this blue curve, which do not reach the temperature that we have actually measured. So there are, some, there are events that are now possible that would never have been possible without human-induced climate change. And for heat waves, this is something we actually see quite a lot. For heavy rainfall, the, uh, it's usually more that we see, um, yeah, sort of a 10 times increase or a doubling in the likelihood. Um, but for heat waves, climate change has completely changed <coughs> what the weather used to be. And there's, of course, this is the, the idea, how it works, which is very straightforward. Doing it is less straightforward, so there's a long version. I'm not going to talk about this. If you want to read about the long version, um, you, you can do that, because in order to be able to do that, you need to know what has actually happened, who was impacted, you need weather stations observations, which for a large part of the globe, we don't actually have. You need climate models that are able to simulate these weather events, and so on. So it's not always straightforward doing it, but the idea is actually quite straightforward. And this science has enabled the IPCC in the last um, assessment report to, for the first time, actually say something about loss and damage. And this was hard in the approval session. I'm very proud that these words are in there. Um, that observed widespread substantial impacts and related losses and damages attributed to climate change have occurred everywhere in the world, in all regions. And you can see on this um, some of the systems, mental health, um, displacement, heat malnutrition, infectious diseases. All these are things we can now very clearly attribute to climate change, to human-induced climate change and actually say this is loss and damage, not just due to weather or bad planning, but human-induced climate change. And that's a major step forward um, that was also um, led, in part at least, to loss and damage being finally taken more seriously at the COP. We can't do this every... We have still lots of data gaps and lots of research gaps, which is why these hexagon plots are here. So the grey hexagons are the areas where at the moment we don't have enough studies, but that doesn't mean we can't do them. So there is a lot of work to do. There is a lot more just science to be done, not just, just transition on the <laughs> mitigation side, but also on the science side. But it is something that we can do. And to come back, to end with Ed's stripes, um, that we care about these stripes and that they are so important are because of the people it affects and the people that have died already and have lost their livelihoods already because of climate change, but the many people and livelihoods we can save by not going to these very high emission scenarios. Thank you. talk today a little bit about the role of the law in all of this, and in particular the role of litigation. Uh, and I'm drawing today on about 10 years of research at the Grantham Research Institute, looking at both climate change legislation, the laws that countries pass to address climate change, and climate change litigation, but I'll be focusing on the latter. I want to start by introducing you to two uh, climate change cases. The first, which um, is here and I'll talk about in a second, is really looking backwards and thinking about who is responsible for paying for all of the losses and damages that Freddie has just been talking about. 
And the second kind of case I'm going to talk about is forward-looking. It's about those scenarios that Yuri was showing us and who has duties and responsibilities to try and get us to comply with those scenarios or to meet those scenarios. So this case, the first case I wanted to talk about, is uh, about um, was filed in the 15th of September just this year by uh, the state of California against five major fossil fuel companies and some of their subsidiaries. And the case essentially argues that these fossil fuel companies knowingly cause significant greenhouse gas emissions to be emitted into the atmosphere through um, the extraction and the burning of fossil fuels, and that they also engaged in a campaign of deception and fraud uh, around the impacts that these fossil fuels would have on the public. Now, California's case is not the first case of its kind to be raising these kinds of issues. It builds on around 20 other cases that have been filed by cities and states across the US. But I think it's very significant that an economy the size of California, um, that is itself a big fossil fuel producer, has nonetheless decided that this kind of litigation is significant enough and likely enough to have some chance of success or at least some chance of impacting uh, the climate debate, that they've gone ahead and filed a case as well. I've mentioned that there are more than 20 of these cases in the US. There are also a number of cases that are looking at who should pay the costs of um, climate damages uh, elsewhere in the world. Two cases in particular filed in Europe, but by plaintiffs in the global south, in Peru and Indonesia, who are arguing that European companies... Uh, the German energy giant RWE and the, uh, the Swiss uh, cement giant Holson should be responsible for paying some of the costs that their communities are incurring. So that's the, the backward-looking cases, and these really um, wouldn't have been possible about 10 years ago without some of the science that uh, Freddie has just been talking about. This is a picture of one of the lawyers in uh, one of the forward-looking cases that I've mentioned. This is Donald Poles, and he is celebrating a landmark victory that he has just received from the Hague District Court in 2021. This was a case that was brought by Milieu de Fancy, the NGO that Donald works for, against Shell, again. And the argument was not that Shell should have to pay for the damages that its pollution is causing, but instead that Shell needed to listen to the science that we've just been hearing about and rapidly reduce emissions in line with um, the need to get to net zero and 1.5 degrees. And the court examined Shell's transition plan and they said, you know what, you're not acting fast enough. You need to do more by 2030. You need to reduce emissions by at least 45% um, by, uh, on 2019 levels by 2030. Now that case is under appeal. We don't know what will happen in the courts. But I think it's really important because, one, it's given rise to a number of other cases before European courts against um, uh, other fossil fuel companies, but even banks and supermarkets. And two, it builds on a whole host of cases against governments, which are also arguing that governments have legal duties to do more to stop climate change and to act in line with the science. So putting these two cases in perspective, are these just isolated incidents? I've told you about, what, sort of 40 cases? Well, they're not. We know that there are more than 2,300 cases around the world that mention material issues of climate change science fact or um, law. Um, most of these have been filed since the Paris Agreement, and most of them have also been filed in the US. That's the lighter coloured bars you can see. But they now exist in at least 50 countries around the world. And one of the things that's very significant about this field and where it differs from other fields is that it's not just uh, cases that are you know, trying to resolve run-of-the-mill disputes between neighbours about um, you know, sort of land boundaries and things, but many of these cases are intentionally filed with the goal of influencing the wider policy debate on climate change. And of course, the cases I've just been talking about fall within that category. <laughs> I want to say two things about strategic cases before I move on. The first is this warning sign we see. Not all strategic climate litigation is aligned with climate goals. There are increasing numbers of cases being filed before the courts which seek to challenge or delay climate action. A good example is a case that was just heard in Canada, where Canada's Impact Assessment Act that required the federal government to think about 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions when approving new projects, was struck down after a legal challenge by the state of Alberta, the province of Alberta, I should say. And the second is a case that's been filed by a group of homeowners in California who are um, arguing that California's zero emissions vehicle mandate are unfairly impacts on them and their ability to enjoy their homes. So uh, perhaps uh, using some of the narratives that Nick was talking about on the just transition. The other thing I want to say about strategic cases is that although I focus quite heavily on cases against companies, actually the majority of these cases are against governments. Many of them are challenging the ambition or implementation of government's climate targets. There are now more than 80 such cases around the world, and some of them have met with big successes. So the final thing I want to talk about then is uh, what does all of this mean and how does it help us to get to net zero? Well, the IPCC in its uh, uh, 2022 assessment report recognised for the first time that climate change litigation is influencing the outcomes and ambition of climate action. And that was based on a series of academic studies that have started to be developed to try and uh, impact this area. One of the newer ones that wasn't included in the IPCC uh, 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 assessment uh, is this one, uh, where you can see the results on the, um, on the slide here. And this was an effort that was uh, led by Joanna Setzer, uh, Frank Venmans, and Misato Sato, all of whom I think are in this room this evening um, and have been working at Grantham for a long time. And this study, we tried to understand whether or not when a climate case is filed against a company, it has an impact on that company's share price. And our results suggest that it does. And this is just one of the ways in which we see climate change litigation influencing um, uh, the action towards the transition that we've just been hearing about. So I think the role of the law in uh, this net zero transition is a very significant one. It's often not one that people have heard about, uh, but we do see that these cases are a big driver uh, of some of the ambition that we know is lacking. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I'll bring you some good news. So you're all here because you care about climate change. So I was going to bring you some good news. So you're all here because you care about climate change. And I just have to tell you, you have just witnessed a tour de force because it's really been a spectacular hour. I think we'd be challenged to find anywhere else by some outstanding speakers and really uh, impeccable background and commitment to the cause and quality. So I think we all be pleased. I'm certainly uh, privileged to be here and just been sat through that, so I think it's fantastic. So my task now is to, to, to gather just a few questions, a couple of questions in the audience, and then we'll take one online. And I'm going to try and uh, we'll bring those questions together, and then let each, each of our panel members to try and answer it. So if you could please raise your hands, and you're going to need one of the lucky ones. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for your time tonight. That was wonderful. Um, Ileana from Systemic, if that helps uh, for context. I was just wondering regarding the task transition. I think it's a bit of a generic term and like we tend to use it in different contexts, but it can mean different things in different contexts. And I'm talking specifically about countries and jurisdictions. So the just transition is different in the US and different in Africa and different in Indonesia for well-known reasons pertaining to purchasing power and the fundamental problems and the starting points of these countries. So what's the thinking behind that and how do we ensure just transitions across jurisdictions? Thank you. Just transition and uh, can you please raise your hands again? That was the quickest one there again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Oh, yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you to the panel. My name is Julia. I'm an LSE alumni and working mm -hmm. at the EBRD right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about mobilizing finance, both for public institutions as well as private. Um, and I think it's the private that do have the biggest role to play in this. I think especially if you look at MDB lending, it's not significant if you compare it to 
any of the major corporate banks. I just wanted to ask the panel how you see this uh, playing out in the future. Can we actually expect private and corporate banks um, to participate in the just transition and green transition? Thank you. So how to mobilize private finance? Uh, oh. Do we have a microphone in the front? <laughs> the longest way I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've had lots of good questions online, so I've selected one that I think the whole panel will have a chance to express their views on. What does the panel, and this is from Susie Shingler, she doesn't say uh, where she's from, but what did the panel make of the UK government's decision <laughs> to continue to offer new licenses for drilling for oil and gas in the North Sea? And I'm looking forward to hearing what the answers are. It's going to be quick. I think I'll be surprised to hear a diversity of answers. <laughs> Let's see if we can get a diversity of answers. So, Brian, do you want to start us off? Well, I'll start on number three, give a very short answer. Pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do the other ones. Right, uh, they're I'll definitely in LSE answers. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Take, yeah. Take, take the answer. You want. <laughs> also, on, only on the on the last uh, question. Um, well, not only aligning with with, with Brian's uh, very skillful uh, <laughs> uh, description of the situation. I think uh, not only the the licensing uh, or, or, or the new licenses, but also kind of the rollback on the key uh, on key policies that. Uh, Will result in a slower transition and, and, and a long and a stronger lock-in into into technologies that we need to get rid of. Um, yeah, is is really not the right way and, and not the right way forward for a even even not for a just transition. Is this is this one working? Yeah, um, I I agree with what's just been said about what the UK government had recently done. Um, I, what I wanted to do is underline how damaging that is internationally. Uh, I was in India when it was announced and our friends were just saying, what is going on? Have you guys discovered something that is uh, all too difficult and should we go slower? And it has reduced uh, confidence and increased the cost of uh, capital. So it's, the damage is not just inside, it's right across the board. On the just transition, um, I'll, I'll say something about across countries and Nick will say something about within countries and I'll probably leave Nick to Nick, the, the other Nick, the, um, uh, the, the private, private banking, but you know, I do have views on that and, and I'm very fond of the EBRD where I used to work. But the, um, I worked very closely with Prime Minister Meles of uh, Ethiopia uh, in various guises for um, 10 or 15 years. And I was on the platform on Africa Day uh, in uh, COP17 in Durban with him. And the question of justice came up and people were arguing that it's just for uh, poor countries to emit because rich countries got rich by emitting. And he said very clearly and strongly it is not justice to foul the planet because other people have fouled it in the past. And those were Mellis's words. When I think about justice, I think in terms of what Amartya Sen teaches us about that. And he says it's easier to define injustice. Injustice is a right denied. So that pushes the argument back, what are the relevant rights? In, in my view, there is no right to emit. As uh, Freddie argued very clearly and strongly, emissions kill. There is no right to emit. There is a right to development, and that view of human rights is in terms of common humanity, our ability to uh, take ourselves forward, and the right to development is a right that's fairly well, fairly well recognised, and there's underlining common humanity arguments to support it. So by emitting, we damage other people's right to development, uh, particularly poorer people, but of course we're thinking of future generations. And I think that's the sensible way to think about injustice. You can't just say injustice is everything I don't like. You actually have to have an argument that sets out what it is. 
So it, it turns on the right to development because rich countries have done so much damage to the right of development, and they will be doing damage to the right of development over the future, they then, in, in my view, f in that deductive way, have an obligation to reduce emissions very strongly themselves and to support, particularly through finance, but also through technology, the right to development in developing countries. And that's exactly what we've been uh, trying to do. But it worries me sometimes that just transition is used in a loose way just to, just to sort of try to give some support for whatever it is I'm enthusiastic about. We can do much better than that, and I think we should. So on the, the licensing, oil and gas licensing, I, I think to, to add to what's been said, I mean, it's also flew in the face of all the recommendations from the Climate Change uh, Committee and others uh, the analysis, it doesn't, doesn't actually help with energy security, which is the basis on which these uh, decisions were made. And also, I think it, 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 it uh, is also made in the context where the development of the North Sea has been done without consideration for uh, a transition for that, their work, workforce. There's been a big gap in the, in the, in the policy. So it's, um, it's a leadership failure. Um, it's going to lock in um, uh, jobs and, and development in, in the North Sea in the oil and gas sector, which does need to be brought uh, to the end and with a, uh, a just transition for that workforce, um, when actually there are a lot of um, programs that are being developed um, by, by workers and communities to do exactly that. So it's a, it's a very regrettable uh, backward step. Um, on, on, on the just transition, I think it is clearly uh, a combination of two things. We do need to have uh, global standards and principles, particularly around human rights, particularly around labor standards, particularly to give the just transition a spine so it doesn't become uh, uh, everything that anyone wants it to be. But it does have to be interpreted in, cord in accordance with national circumstances. One example was recently some work that was published in South Africa uh, by TIPS, the Trade and Industry Policy Studies um, Group, which was trying to divide what could be conceived as a just transition, finance transition in South Africa. They looked at what had been done and done by people here in, in London and said, well, that's fine. But because we have the legacy of apartheid, we have the legacy of, of, um, in, uh, of, of colonialism and so on, and because of our circumstances, we need to do it in a certain way, and particularly we need to emphasize certain parts of the just transition for our circumstances. So clear uh, global principles, um, but also the need to really adapt it to, to circumstances. And finally, on the, uh, the finance side, um, clearly we need to reform all the... Uh, the failures uh, in, in the market which misprice uh, carbon, we know, we know that. Uh, we need to reform energy, agriculture, and all these other policies. But we also need to sort of fix um, problems in the, in the financial system itself. One of the things that actually the UK is doing well at the moment um, is uh, designing a framework for mandatory publication of transition plans, net zero transition plans, which will be a requirement for all major firms, all major businesses, but also major banks banks, pension funds, insurance companies, and so on, to actually set out not just what targets they have, but how they're going to get there in terms of business models, in terms of their capital expenditure, in terms of consultation with stakeholders, and in terms of the governance. Now, that is going to become uh, mandatory, hopefully soon, uh, but I think it might be a bit of politics in when. Yeah, well, as Brian said, most of these questions are LSE questions, so um, I... I just want to, on the just transition, um, highlight one aspect that we often don't talk about because, as I've shown, there is also, and, and Brian's, um, Brian has also shown, we also need to adapt. So there is no um, climate change is already here, and um, adaptation at the moment is when it, adaptation funding is usually for kit. It's for building a dam, for doing some infrastructure, but. Well, the Paris Agreement is a human rights um, treaty, and we care about climate change because we care about humans. And what actually may, leads to the largest vulnerability is not that there is no, no dam or that there's no infrastructure, but that there are no people who can maintain the dams, that there are no people who can maintain the weather stations, who can build the early warning systems, who can do the communication. So I think what is really, really important for 
a just adaptation is the investment in people and the capacity of people and the long-term partnerships and not doing some developmental aid to build a three-year dam project and then go away, but the, the really the long-term investment in the people and then the, the human capacities. That is what, what will create resilience and the biggest gain on adaptation. Well, maybe I'll, I'll build on what Freddie's just said on uh, just adaptation by mentioning a case that's just been filed in the last week in the UK, which is uh, actually challenging the UK and our adaptation response and the way in which that is failing communities because we aren't building in this kind of resilience into the system. Uh, and that, I think, shows that one of the things we can learn from litigation is where there are a lot of gaps. Um, so it's often kind of the canary in the coal mine on what has been lacking in just transition responses. And one of the things we're trying to do is, is study that and, and understand actually how can we design policy in ways that will avoid these kinds of cases from happening in the future. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, private finance mobilisation. Um, so Nick has already talked about some of the legislative changes that are coming in in different jurisdictions to require um, private finance institutions to do more or to consider climate risks um, more uh, fully in um, uh, their internal processes. We're also seeing that uh, as an area where we have a lot of climate change cases. So a case was filed earlier this year against BNP Paribas arguing that um, they are breaching human rights standards under a French piece of legislation called the Duty of Vigilance Law, which requires companies to uh, think about human rights and environmental impacts in their business plans. Um, and uh, the argument is that by continuing to finance fossil fuels, uh, they are breaching this law. Uh, and so we are seeing already the legislation we have in place being used to try and um, force more action, uh, but I think we're also going to see much more legislation in the future. Uh, and then on the final point about the licensing, I think that's, that's been adequately covered. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just one thing to the question from EBRD about private finance, because it, it, it's absolutely uh, central. Um, insisting on transparency, insisting on legal responsibilities is one thing and it's important, but so too is the enabling. And uh, in the report, which uh, you probably saw the report from N.K. Singh and Larry Summers, I, I was part of that so-called independent expert group, and we recommended that the uh, uh, financial flows from the MDBs uh, are tripled at, <clears throat> and that they work much more closely with the private sector and they work much better together as a group to create the uh, environment and uh, country platform investment climate where those investments can take uh, place. So it involves um, reducing the risk on the investment themselves and guarantees, equity, mezzanine loans and so on, various combinations of support from the MDBs which can help share and reduce the risk to the uh, private sector. So it's one thing to do the transparency and the obligations, but you also have to enable the investment and act to share the risk. That was welcomed by the G20 finance ministers and by the heads of the MDBs, including President O'Deal of your institution. Brian. Yes, could I slightly elaborate my discussion? <laughs> 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 um, I'm... Our Climate Change Act in 2008 that went through Parliament, 453 for and I think five against, something like that. We know who they were. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and those five have multiplied somewhat, but anyway. Um, and it is a fantastic act. It, is, it uh, had the, the target in there, which was 80% reduction, which was later changed to 100% by 2050. And it had the um, five-year targets for carbon budgets and uh, these are set agreed by Parliament and once they've been set the government has a legal obligation to go towards those targets. Now I sat up there, another part of the Climate Change Act was the Climate Change Committee which is there to assist with setting targets and, and suggesting the sorts of policies required and monitoring every year it reports to Parliament and monitors how well the UK government and the UK is doing. And I was on that committee for 10 years. And each year we thought how to make the language slightly more stronger. But the targets 
are fine, the, the agreed carbon budgets are fine, but the policies in place, well, we'll just about get the targets now, but you, the UK government is legally bound to have to start putting the policies in place that will meet the future targets. Those targets already agreed to 2035, and the Climate Change Committee has said in increasingly strong language, the policies are not in place to meet those future targets. And, if, and one of those is our commitment under the UNFCC, our commitment. So we're not doing what we said we would do, even internationally, let alone in our own parliament. And to see them pulling back on what we are doing, I, well, I summarise as pathetic. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, just uh, three thank yous from me. So first of all, of course, thank you to the Grand Plains. Thank you to the Grand Foundation. Thank you to the speakers. Um, it's been, like I said, absolutely amazing. And also the organizing committee, particularly Alison Peacock. Thank you very much. So please share with me. Yeah, I thought we were going to have a few questions. <laughs>